Hi everybody and welcome to part two of the Generative Music AI course. Part two is called Technical Dive. In this part, we're gonna be looking at an array of different generative techniques and study them from a theoretical and practical perspective. Part two is mainly targeted at engineers. However, musicians can also take advantage of part two, especially when I show all the different techniques from a theoretical perspective. Here's the menu of all the different generative techniques that we are gonna be covering during part two. These are generative grammars, mark of chains, cellular automata, genetic algorithms, transformers, and music gen. That's a system that leverages a transformer architecture. This system is quite impressive and was published by Meta. As for all the techniques highlighted in blue, we're gonna be looking both at the theory and the implementation of these techniques. For music gen, we're only gonna be looking at the theory. We're not gonna be implementing music gen from scratch. Today, we're gonna to be starting our journey by looking at generative grammars, and we'll cover quite a lot of terrain. We'll start by looking at the intuition behind generative grammars, then we'll formalize generative grammars, we'll look at a particular type of grammar called a probabilistic grammar, then we'll move on to how to leverage these generative grammars for music generation. I'm gonna suggest some guidelines to design generative grammars for music generation. Finally, we're gonna be looking at a particular type of generative grammar called a Lindermayer system or L system. What is the intuition behind a generative grammar? Here you have it. Generative grammars are a set of rules and symbols that systematically describe how strings of a language or musical elements in the case of music can be generated. Let's break this sentence down into a number of different components. First, we can say that generative grammars describe a formal language. They can be used to either pass or generate sentences for that particular language. And when I mention parsing, I mean analyzing and extracting information from that language. Because they leverage symbols and rules, generative grammars are rule-based systems. Generative grammars have the capacity of generating a ton of strings out of a small set of rules. That's why we call them generative, because there's this generative aspect that defines them. Finally, as you might guess, generative grammars come directly from linguistics. In order to define a generative grammar, we can use a four tuple made up of four different sets. We can call them N, T, P, and S. Let's look at each of these sets in isolation. N is a set of non-terminal symbols. We can call them variables. These are placeholders that can be replaced with all the items of T, T being a set of terminal symbols. We can call this an alphabet. These are all symbols that cannot be replaced, that are not placeholders. They are the ultimate symbols that remain in the strings that we want to generate. Then obviously we have P that is a set of all the production rules. We can call production rules also replacement rules. And the idea is that we map one symbol onto a number of other symbols. Finally, we have S that is the starting symbol that initiates the whole process. I'm quite sure that all of this may feel a little bit abstract up until this point. So I'm gonna give you a simple linguistic example of a generative grammar so that we can understand all of these abstract concepts and ideas very easily. In this grammar, we have a super simple set of terminal symbols, and these are I, like, and apples. Then for the non-terminal symbols, or as we can call them, the variables, the placeholders, we have four symbols, 
Capsule S, that stands for sentence. It's the whole sentence. Then we have PN, that's a pronoun. Then we have V, which stands for verb. And then we have N, which stands for noun. The start symbol is capsule S, that as we've defined in the N set is a sentence. Here is the set of all the production rules that we have in this grammar. The first one is a replacement rule that tells us that whenever we encounter the S symbol, the sentence, we can map that onto three different symbols, a PN, pronoun, a verb, and a noun. Then we have three other replacement rules that start from non-terminals and arrive at a terminal replacement. For example, we map a pronoun into I, a verb into like, and N into apples. Let's see how we can generate a string starting from this very simple grammar. We already mentioned that the starting symbol is S, it's the sentence. So in order to move on to S to the next level, we should take the production rule for S. So we come up with a new output that is PN, pronoun, verb, and noun. Then we take the first item of the output and we apply the associated production rule. In the case of pronoun, we get I, so that we get an overall output now that is I, verb, noun. Next step, we move on to V, to the verb. We get the production rule associated with V, that is, Every time you get a V, you transform that as you map that onto like. And so the final output at this iteration is gonna be I like, and we still have N, and we have to replace N with another symbol. So what can we do there? Well, we should get the production rule associated to N, that is N is mapped onto apples, and so, we get the final output that is, I like apples. We run this replacement process until we have all terminal symbols in the generated string. The basic idea is that the output no longer has any non-terminal symbol. So we've basically applied all the rules until we now are at a level where we don't need to apply those rules anymore because we all, all we have is a bunch of terminal symbols or constants. This example really doesn't do a lot of justice to generative grammars because it was a very convoluted process in order to generate a very simple sentence like, I like apples. Indeed, we were dealing or we are dealing with a deterministic grammar. That means that every time we run this algorithm with all the production rules, we always get the very same output in the end because this is a deterministic process. There's another option to make things a little bit spicier, and that is a probabilistic grammar. I'm gonna expand on the simple deterministic grammar that we had and add some elements in order to make it probabilistic. So first of all, we want to add more terminal symbols, and in particular, I'm gonna add you and love. And then I'm gonna change a couple of production rules down here. For PN, for the pronoun, we now have 50% probability of getting the I pronoun and 50% probability of getting you as pronoun. Same thing more or less happens for the verb production rule. Every time we get a V symbol, we have 70% chance of getting like as a replacement symbol and 30% of getting love. Now let's rerun all the production rules, but this time with the probabilistic grammar. Still, we're gonna be starting from S, the overall sentence. We're gonna be rewriting S with a pronoun, a verb, and a noun. Now, we take the pronoun and we obviously take the associated production rule that this time is probabilistic, so we have 50% probability of getting I and 50% probability of getting you. Let's assume that 
we get or we choose U. So here we can get the output and now we're going to be having for the output U verb noun. We're going to be applying the V production rule to the V item here in the output and this time once again we're going to have a probabilistic rule so we can get either like or love. Let's say we choose love so we are going to replace V for love and so the current output is going to be you love noun. We are going to be applying the noun production rule and this one is deterministic so we know that we're going to be getting apples. So all in all we're going to get an output that is you love apples but we could have easily got I like apples or you like apples. You get the point here. The basic idea is that you have a limited amount of symbols, both terminal and non-terminal. You can come up with a list of production rules. Some of this can be deterministic. The majority most of the time will be probabilistic and then you can generate a whole lot of sentences or strings. Let's see how we can leverage this linguistic idea for music generation. I've compiled a simple generative grammar that we can use to generate music. Let's take a look at all the different sets that define it. First we can take a look at the set of terminal symbols. These are the union of the diatonic pitches contained in the C major scale along with some durations like whole note or half note. These are very concrete symbols. Then we have the set of non-terminals or variables. These are melody, phrase, pitch and duration. As you can see this live at a higher level of abstraction. The starting point here is melody. Let's take a look at the set of production rules. Melody gets mapped onto two phrases, phrase and phrase. A phrase gets mapped onto either pitch and duration or pitch, pitch and duration. I'm not specifying the probability here and by doing that I just imply that there's a homogeneous distribution of probability. So in this case pitch duration and pitch pitch duration have 50% chance of getting chosen. Then we can take a look at pitch. Pitch can be replaced by any of the seven notes of the C major scale. Finally duration can be replaced either by whole, half or quarter. I think you now have the elements for grasping how powerful a generative grammar can be. The main power here comes from this idea of encapsulating different level of abstractions with different symbols in the non-terminal symbols that can be replaced by other sets of non-terminals, sequences of non-terminals and terminal symbols. In this way you can obtain a quite complex representation of music that allows you to generate complex musical ideas. Let's see this generative music grammar in action. We'll start with the initial symbol and we mentioned that that is the melody. Next we want to replace melody with two phrases and that's the production rule associated with melody. Then we get the first phrase item and we apply the phrase production rule. This is a probabilistic one and we have either pitch duration or pitch pitch duration and let's assume that the output that we've chosen is pitch duration. So now the overall output is going to be pitch duration plus phrase. Next we apply the pitch production rule and because that's the first item that's a non-terminal in the output from the previous iteration. So we get the pitch uh, production rule. Let's assume we get C and so now we have C duration and phrase. So how do we continue? Well we now 
apply the duration production rule. We don't apply the C production rule because it doesn't exist because C is a terminal symbol, is a constant. Rather, we want to apply the production rule for the first non-terminal that we encounter in the output sequence at any iteration. We choose quarter from the production rule associated to duration. Next, we have to take the phrase production rule. Let's assume we choose pitch, pitch, duration. And now we just continue. Next, we have to take the pitch uh, rule. Let's assume we get an E. So now the overall output is C quarter E pitch duration. We can continue, we get a D. And finally, we take a look at the final production rule that is duration. And let's assume we get a whole. So now the overall sequence of terminal symbols is C quarter E D whole. There you have a melody. Of course, if you rerun this music example, you're probably gonna get something different because the music grammar that I've created is probabilistic, so you're gonna end up with different melodies in the end. I'm sure you may be wondering, but how can we determine these production rules? There are two ways. One is manual, the other one is automatic. As for the manual one, this is a job that music theorists, musicologists and composers can carry out. They just go out, look at a corpus, perhaps in a particular style. They try to understand how that particular musical style works and they extract, they infer the rules manually. This can take a lot of time and can be a daunting process. There's an advantage in crafting production rules manually. That is that you're not bound to a particular style and you can be as creative as you want. If you're a composer, for example, you can explore production rules that are specific to that particular compositional need that you have in that particular time. There's also the opportunity of automatically learning rules and their associated probabilities directly with algorithms. What these algorithms do is that they look at a musical corpus, they parse musical phrases or the overall music, they extract rules and they determine most of the time also occurrence of those rules. In other words, they get probabilities. The great thing about this approach is that it can work at scale and it's quite quick when compared with the manual approach. The problem though is that all that you're gonna get is a set of rules that come directly from your data set, from your musical corpus. So you're not gonna get anything that's creative or unheard of. Generative grammars have been extensively used for carrying out all sorts of music generation tasks. They've been used for generating melodies, chord progressions, musical structure, or full track generation. I've used them extensively to experiment with melody generation, drum pattern generation. It's a very rich way and creative way of getting a lot of musical ideas. When you decide to design a generative grammar for music generation, there are a few things that you should be very careful about. First, you should find the correct music representation because that is key. And indeed, you should ask, what musical dimensions do I want to capture? and how do I want to capture them through symbols. Indeed, finding the right mapping, the right level of abstraction and representation for your generative grammar is gonna be key for the successful of your system. It goes without saying that it doesn't exist a perfect music representation or mapping that you can use for all the music generation tasks out there. You have to find a particular mapping that's ideal for your particular use case. That can take quite a lot of time and research. Before moving on with the remaining part of the lecture, I just want to quickly remind you that registration for the Generative Music AI Workshop in Barcelona at the Music Technology Group 
is now open. If you want to take all the things that you're learning with this course and put them in practice, networking with other people and working on an amazing AI music project, the workshop is just perfect for you. This is the workshop's website hosted by University Pompeo Fabra. Here you have all the necessary information. Remember that the workshop runs from the 11th until the 15th of December 2023 and you can register here. We have 30 spots, 20 of which for engineers and 10 for musicians. I hope to see you in Barcelona next month. Now back to the lecture. That's one particular subset of generative grammars called Lindenmayer system that's been used extensively in music generation. The point of a Lindenmayer system or an L system is that it applies all the rewriting rules, all the production rules at once at each iteration. It doesn't go sequence by sequence, but rather it takes all the non-terminal symbols that you have in your output and it applies all the production rules to all of them at, at once. You can think of it as a sort of parallel rewriting schema. This parallel rewriting approach ensures that the output is self-similar at different levels of abstraction. In other words, we can use L systems to generate fractals. This is one of the reasons why this particular type of generative grammar has been extensively used for generating music because of that level of self-similarity that you get inherently from this algorithm that works really well for a musical output. Lyndon Mayer, who was a biologist originally, came up with L systems in order to describe growth patterns of biological systems, like for example, bacteria or plants. Here you see the original L system that Lyndon Mayer came up with for modeling the growth of algae. It can be defined with three simple sets. First, we have the alphabet, that is the set of all the terminal and non-terminal symbols. In this case, we just have two, A and B. Then we have S, that is the starting point. In L system lingo, we call it an axiom. And the axiom in this case is gonna be A. And finally, we have a couple of production rules. A is gonna generate AB and B is gonna generate A. So let's see this L system example in action. We'll start with the uh, axiom and that is A, then we're gonna just replace A by using the associated production rule. That is, we move from A to AB. We now have AB at the first iteration. Then we apply all the production rules at once. And that's the main difference with the other generative grammars that we've seen earlier. So how does this work? Well, we take A and we do apply the relative, the associated production rule, and we get this output here, that is AB. And then we can take the second item in the original output at the first iteration, that is B, and we apply the associated production rule. So we get A and we put it here in the output. And we can do this at the next level of depth once again. So we take a and we apply the relative production rule and we get a b then we get uh, we take b we apply the relative production rule and we get a and finally we take a we apply the relative production rule and we take a b so the overall output now at level three is a b a a b we can continue to apply production rules recursively at level four five six seven so on and so forth as you might notice, the outputs there are highly self-similar. Congrats, you've made it to the end of this lecture. By now you should have a quite good understanding of generative grammars and Lindenmayer systems and how they can be used for generating music. Let's wrap up this lesson by looking at important points that we made. 
First, generative grammars use symbols and rules to generate strings. The great thing about this algorithm is that you can generate a ton of strings out of a minimal amount of rules and symbols. Generative grammars have been used for a lot of generative music tasks like melody generation or chord generation. There are both deterministic grammars and probabilistic grammars. The latter are more interesting because they allow you to create music or any kind of output in a stochastic manner. There are a couple of ways to come up with production rules. You can create them manually or you can learn them or have an algorithm learn them directly from a corpus of musical compositions. Finding the right music representation and mapping between the symbols and the musical entities that you want to generate at all different levels is going to be key to have a system that works well for what you want to achieve. Finally, there's a subset of generative grammars called Lindermeyer systems or L systems that's particularly useful for generating music. What makes L systems unique is that they use a parallel rewriting strategy. When you use that for generating music, you're going to end up with highly self-similar music that usually tends to work quite well. That's all for today's lecture. Next time, we're going to take all the concepts that we've learned today and we're going to be implementing them in Python. We're going to be coding an L system that can generate chord progressions automatically. Before you go, there's a simple thing that you can do to help this channel a lot and that is smashing the like button and subscribing to The Sound of AI if you're not a subscriber yet. It costs you nothing and for us, it's a huge help. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll see you next time. Take care for now.